Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to uh, the, the second panel of the Central European Forum 2012 here in this beautiful theatre. My name is Chris Keulemans. I'm a writer and a journalist from Amsterdam, Holland. I'm thrilled to be part of this. We have three um, highly respected writers, travellers, observers with us on stage this afternoon. Um, and in the next hour or so, we're going to tackle one of the most important and urgent questions uh, that we face today. Uh, last year, on the same stage, during the same forum, Peter Esterhazy, the Hungarian writer, he said, freedom is slipping away. It's slipping through our fingers as we speak. This year, uh, Martin Simečka, one of the uh, masterminds behind this forum, uh, wrote in his introduction, lies and hatred thrive most when they are ignored. So if we, the well-thinking people like all of us here tonight, if we uh, keep love and truth in the sense that Václav Havel uh, used those words, if we keep love and truth to ourselves, we will lose democracy. So yes, it's a serious issue. Uh, we're seeing it um, day by day in all of our societies here in Europe. Right now, I understood there's a demonstration going on here in the streets of Bratislava uh, against the corruption of justice. Maybe some of you were there then and are here now. Uh, today, ironically maybe, is the International Day for Tolerance all over the world. But uh, earlier this week, we saw um, public rage, public demonstrations, public violence all over the streets of Europe um, by people protesting against the lies that they have been told about the economy in Greece, in Spain, in Portugal, in Italy. So, yes, um, love and truth, important, but um, lies and hatred are uh, rampant, are all over our societies. I will introduce the writers here on stage one by one and we'll ask them a number of questions in the next hour or so and at the end I hope some of you will have questions to ask them as well. Uh, to begin with, Andrzej Staziuk from Poland, living in the countryside. Tjerna. Very exciting to... Um, to have him here on this stage. He's a fabulous writer. Um, White Raven was one of his beautiful novels. After that followed the tales of Galicia, Dukla, Fado, On the Road to Babadog. He's a, also a sheep farmer. He's also a publisher. He's a man of many gifts and he is one of those people who, who, who cherishes um, the Europe that he was born and raised in, and this part of Europe where he travels a lot, observes, comments, um, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, compares what he's read in the books that he admires to the countryside and the cities and the villages that he discovers along the way. Um, Poland, he said about his own country, if the world associates my country with anything, it is Auschwitz. So, Mr. Stasiuk knows that uh, Poland is a country where um, lies and hatred can still fire up when um, they are not being dealt with in a, in a public, civilized way. Mr. Stasiuk, I'm going to ask you uh, my first question. Can you give us one very recent example of uh, hatred, of intolerance in your country? Hmm, hmm. I'm trying to remember, and it's difficult for me. And I can't remember anything. To zależy, jaką nienawiść nam chodzi. Ja myślę, że społeczeństwa i ludzie w jakimś sensie 
żyją nienawiścią, nienawiść jest im potrzebna. Używają je do tego, żeby konstruować swoją tożsamość, żeby znajdować swoje miejsce w świecie. I na przykład 11 listopada w Polsce jest święto niepodległości, odzyskania niepodległości. I przez y, cały dzień od południa do, 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 do wieczora przez centrum Warszawy szły chyba trzy, trzy albo cztery demonstracje. I pomiędzy nimi właściwie nie było porozumienia poza porozumieniem nienawiści. Bo w końcu to uczucie to jest uczucie, które też łączy, tak jak miłość tak naprawdę. Gdyby te demonstracje szły w próżni pewnej, to nie byłoby żadnej ekscytacji, nie byłoby żadnego życia emocjonalnego w tym wszystkim. Także z tą nienawiścią jest bardzo skomplikowana sprawa tak we współczesnym świecie. Mhm. Może nasza tożsamość zostanie jakoś zdekonstruowana, kiedy pozbędziemy się całkowicie nienawiści? Ja myślę, że e, trudniej jest dyskutować o tym, czy ta nie ma być, czy, czy ma i nie być. Myślę, że sensownie jest wynaleźć sposób na kanalizację tej nienawiści, na to, co z nią robić, bo ona nie zniknie przecież. Thank tak myślę. Okay. Thank you. So hatred uniting people in the streets of Warsaw last week on Independence Day and one of the major questions I think of this afternoon is the one you, you give us. Um, maybe we need hatred to construct our identity. How can we imagine our society without hatred? Essential question. Then uh, Vladimir Asenievich from Belgrade. Please a round of applause for him as well. And I'm afraid you, you will have to use the same microphone to answer my question. Uh, Vladimir Asenievich uh, is a Serbian writer, translator, editor, traveler and columnist. Um, with his first novel, translated as In the Hold, uh, translated into 20 languages, um, he wrote an anti-war novel uh, during the war in uh, former Yugoslavia. Written, written from and, and, and playing in Belgrade. Uh, that was the first very public sign of Vladimir Asenievich uh, is certainly not part of the mainstream in Serbia. Um, on the contrary, he's been a um, tough, brave uh, critic of nationalism and uh, intolerance inside his own society. Uh, he's not afraid of making enemies. He was one of the people who actually uh, urged The, the, the Serbian uh, recognition of Kosovar independence uh, when it happened a couple of years ago. Now, that doesn't make you very popular in the streets of Belgrade, I'm sure. Uh, and he describes his own city as such. Uh, if Europe were a pub or kafana, Belgrade would be like that small, smelly hallway that leads to the toilet. Vladimir, could you tell us Give us just one recent example of violent intolerance in your society. Well, uh, my society is such that there are always numerous examples of uh, such a thing. So I always get kind of, when I'm asked uh, such a question, I get kind of blocked because all mm. of a sudden there's, you know, tens of different possible things that I could talk about. Uh, although I think that Every society is really filled with uh, hatred. It's just a matter of how it is controlled rather than whether it exists or, or, mm -hmm. or does not. Um, something which is really obvious and, and concerns uh, Serbia in the last decade or so is the, um, uh, the hatred uh, from the 1990s which uh, expressed itself in the ethnic uh, uh, struggles and, uh, and violence. 
um, actually largely turned uh, non-ethnic in, in this last mm -hmm. decade or two. Uh, so the main uh, really uh, target of the hatred of the right-wing and ultra right-wing groups in Serbia nowadays are actually gay people. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of funny. Uh, it's funny because um, uh, it's not that they are not anti-gay, obviously they are, but they would prefer not to really think about sexual, sexual, the, the questions of sexual, sexual freedom. Uh, but it's just the fact that uh, uh, um, um, in the situation in which Serbia is now, uh, they seem to be the most obvious targets. So from the year 2000 uh, onwards, there was about five attempts of... Uh, uh, you know, organizing a uh, pride parade, and none of them uh, succeeded. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was lots of violence. Uh, so there was something really um, uh, discouraging in the fact that uh, uh, if there would be a gay parade, there would maybe be two or three hundred gay people, maybe the same number of supporters. And then they would be uh, um, uh, confronted with uh, thousands of uh, violent opponents and uh, something and again I don't think that many societies are uh, dramatically different in this, that essence uh, but it's striking in Serbia that uh, it's actually the youth yeah. which, uh, which uh, um, needs and uses this hatred. Again but just like Andrzej Stasiuk you say that there is a necessity for this hatred among among the young generation as well. Yeah, then, I had some I had some discussions of that kind with uh, secondary school uh, students, mm -hmm. and uh, we came to this point. And I was really actually shocked uh, when a number of students were kind of rationally explaining to me that without hatred you would not really know what the love is, and the, so yeah. it's, it's kind of necessary to keep them balanced mm -hmm. and and things like that. So I was really really shocked that. Uh, well, first of all, I was shocked that they were thinking. Hmm. Um, and then second of all, I was shocked that they were thinking in such a wrong, such a wrong way, obviously. I mean, that they were thinking is not bad news. Yeah, yeah, but, obviously. Yeah. I mean, everybody does, so, yeah. And it, it um, starts at young age even. But anyway, we'll get back to this question. This, this necessity, the, the perception that people have that hatred is actually, you know, one of the driving forces of our life. Yeah. Uh, finally, I will introduce you to uh, Jens Martin Eriksen from Denmark, living in Geneva. Uh, like myself, Denmark, like myself, I'm, 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 uh, you're from a country that used to be regarded as a kind of paradise on earth, Denmark, like Holland. Uh, but over the past decade or so, uh, things have become troubled there as well, and now you're living in Switzerland, which... Also, no longer is that peaceful, neutral um, something in the middle of our continent. Uh, Jens Martin Eriksen is an acclaimed novelist, and apart from writing for novels and for the stage, uh, he has also written a couple of very, very important books on exactly the topic we're talking about this afternoon. Together with Frederik Sternfeld, he wrote, for instance, The Anatomy of Hate, about uh, the Bosnian-Serbian war. The Anatomy of Hate could very well be a subtitle for this afternoon's panel. Uh, together, they also recently wrote the democratic, uh, the democratic Contradictions of Multiculturalism. Multiculturalism, a practice that we know in different varieties in all our societies. Mm, very complicated issue, very complicated model. Uh, basically, the book is about who is allowed to say what and when. Mm, Jens Martin Eriksen, I think with your background, with your literary eye and with your experience in traveling in this region of Europe, uh, could you give us one recent example of violent intolerance in your society? Well, as I'm from, uh, originally from Denmark, uh, from Copenhagen, uh, although I'm an immigrant in Switzerland, um, I, I, would, I would tend to mention the cartoon crisis and go into details, but... Okay. Yeah. Uh, and go into details about this. Uh, or more in principle, what was at stake? Why were people discussing so, uh, 
so uh, virulent, in a, such a virulent way, and why did some people attack some embassies and people were killed, and you know the story. Um, but after what happened uh, one and a half year ago in, in Oslo, it, okay, it's in Norway, but our neighboring country, um, uh, I think it's sort of, um, it's, more, it's more maybe more important to, to line up what actually took place uh, uh, and completely um, strange thing happened uh, so a uh, Christian terrorist uh, uh, shot uh, more than 70 people, uh, young people in the socialist, uh, in the Labour Party's uh, uh, youth camp. And um, he also killed some people in Oslo. Uh, I know that uh, some people try to downplay the fact that he was politically motivated and he You're was... You're talking uh, about Breivik, you know? Yeah, Breivik, mm. Anas Bering Breivik. And uh, he was a uh, lunatic, a lonely lunatic, and so on. But if you actually try to look into what he was motivated by, uh, as he was so, uh, he was so um, uh, nice to put uh, 1,500 pages uh, on his internet manifesto on the internet, uh, you will learn that he's actually not, uh, he's coherent he, in his argumentation. Uh, he's very coherent. Uh, it's horrible what he's writing, but he's coherent. And in, in his logistics, to actually succeed with what he was doing, he was also coherent. So we, and that, that's exactly also what the, the, the judge, the, uh, the trial ended up with, uh, judging him as a sane person, not in a political sense, but in a psychological sense. He knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. What could motivate a man to kill more than 60, 70 people, young people, uh, children on a, and young people on a summer camp. Uh, something is going on and something is, is obscured by a lot of, of mysticism. What are people motivated by? Uh, what he was doing, he was, he was looking, he was motivated by a so-called, um, uh, we could call it counter-enlightenment ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, he was against democracy, he's against... Uh, Freedom. Uh, he's against democracy. He's, he's, you could compare him, as a historian in Norway has done, mm -hmm. compare him to the, the system he was advocating is more or less a Christian version in his own understanding of the Iranian system mm. with a guardian council mm. and a guardian council of specially sort of supreme leaders, uh, crusaders, and all his political adversaries, enemies should be killed and mm. so on and so on. And of course, all Muslims should be pushed back to, uh, to Africa, uh, North Africa, Maghreb, where they could set up a caliphate. Uh, that, that's his ideas. And they are clearly not the ideas of a lonely lunatic. Mm -hmm. This is, this is a, a, a kind of version, a Christian version of a, a kind of fascist idea. And, uh, and what can motivate people to do that, uh, things like that? That's what we were learning and studying in Bosnia as well. That is uh, exactly what we're going to talk about now. Yeah. Let's begin with Andrei Stasiuk again. Um, you gave us just one of many examples of public violence in, in, in Poland. We all know that um, Poland is really great at hate speech. Um, just recently, the foreign minister, Sikorski, he went to court because he got crazy by all the hate speech on the internet in Poland. Uh, it can be about the terrible history of the Jews, it can be about the role of the Poles in the Holocaust, it can be about uh, uh, Russians, it can be about homosexuals, about Roma, about Germans, about Muslims. Um, this, this hate speech, this violence is everywhere. And Mr. Stasiuk, I would like to ask you a um, question. What do you think, just like Jens Martin Eriksson says, drives this hatred? What is the deepest source of this ongoing violence and hatred in your society? Nie, ja bym się nie upierał przy tym, że Polska jest jakimś wyjątkiem nienawiści. To nie jest najgorszy kraj, spokojnie, no proszę. Ja myślę, że 
nienawiść jest składnikiem ludzkiej osobowości po prostu. No. Nie da się wystylizować ludzkiej człowieka z podstawowych uczuć, czyli z nienawiści, z miłości, z, nie wiem, ze strachu, z poświęcenia. To są fundamentalne rzeczy. I trudno, przypominałoby to coś w rodzaju hodowli człowieka. Tak jak powiedziałem, chodzi o... Wie pan, to jest tak, że ta nienawiść jeszcze 60-70 lat temu w Europie znajdowała ujście na przykład podczas wojen. Młodzi ludzie, młodzi faceci zwłaszcza, poddają się takim emocjom i takie emocje są im potrzebne. Być może pytanie o to, czy normalny świat jest mm -hmm. światem bez przemocy właśnie, tak jak Europa, z, której, z, z czego jest strasznie dumna rzeczywiście. Cały czas w tej narracji europejskiej pojawia się, słuchajcie, żyjemy w cudownym społeczeństwie, bo od 60 lat nie było wojny. Ale co się dzieje z tymi uczuciami, które powodowały wojnę? Co się dzieje tak naprawdę z uczuciami na pograniczu biologii? Bo to na, dokładnie dotyczy młodych facetów pełnych adrenaliny, pełnych y, steronu i coś z tym trzeba robić. A nie znaleźliśmy metod na to. Mhm. Może internet jest metodą. No. <laughs> bo Nienawiść kapitalnie skrapla się, generuje, buzuje w, w internecie gdzieś. Może to jest opowieść o człowieku przyszłości. Mhm. Ale nie wiem, nie wiem. Ja. I think um, that's very true. I imagine you um, living in Czarne, yeah, the, on the on the, the borders of, of Poland, in the countryside. I can imagine you walking around the countryside in peace, wondering why is it that my society still cannot deal with these troubled memories of German occupation, Russian occupation, uh, the the memories of the holocaust the disappearance of the jews why is it that my society cannot mm, find its way out of those old um, and deeply ingrained feelings of hatred trudno mi odpowiedzieć na to no tak postawię ja myślę że rzeczywiście e, Ludzie z tej części Europy są bardziej oswojeni z przemocą, z nienawiścią. Jakby być, może łatwiej się, być może łatwiej się na nią godzą nawet. Mm -hmm. Jakby to strasznie nie brzmiało oczywiście. Że jest w nich więcej autoironii przede wszystkim. Mm -hmm. Tak mi się wydaje. Mm -hmm. Rzeczywiście ja nie... To ta przeszłość nigdy nie zginęła. Kiedy ja myślę o Polsce, jestem, zawsze jestem zakorzeniony w historii. W tym piekle rosyjsko-polsko-niemiecko-żydowskim. I polsko-polskim też. Dlatego czasami hmm. bardzo trochę trudniej jest rozmawiać z ludźmi z z zachodu tak naprawdę. Czasami jestem w tej dyskusji nieco osamotniony i nie mam języka na przykład. Mm -hmm. Ale tak, myślę, że ludy mm -hmm. tej części Europy są większymi ekspertami od przemocy i od nienawiści. Oczywiście z wielkim ukłonem w stronę Bałkanów mm -hmm. też. Okay. Yes, because in the Balkans too, um, there's a long history of, um, let's say, mutual 
feelings of hatred, revenge, exclusion with all the recurring uh, violence that we know. Uh, um, Vladimir Asunievich, what do you think? Every time that you go crazy about the newest outburst of um, hatred and bigotry and discrimination in your society, what do you think is the, 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 the underlying source? Is it this, is it like Andrei Stasiuk says about Poland that it becomes part of your system, it's almost addictive, uh, uh, you can't imagine life without it? What is it? What is beneath all this recurrence of violence? Well, well, Balkans became synonymous with uh, ethnic and hatred, right? Um, it, in, in this, in such an active way, it does not really have such a long history. Mm -hmm. It does belong to the 20th century mm -hmm. purely. Uh, before that, we lived in separate systems. Mm -hmm. We were divided by half. On one side, there was an Ottoman Empire. On another side, there was an Austro-Hungarian Empire. Both were multicultural. I mean, in a sense of the word, as we, as we know it now, even more so. Uh, because now we do discuss multiculturalism, and we do see that uh, some of the idea has not seen the good realization. Um, you go to California, I don't know, some LA or something, and you see closely tied communities that, I mean, they do mix on the streets, but they do, do not mix thoroughly. And they do remain within, within their communities. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the Balkans, you will see, not only in uh, the region of former Yugoslavia, you will see it in Romania, you will see it in Bulgaria, in other countries, that it is something that's very, very hard to draw a dividing line and to separate one from another. Um, on the example of Bosnia, for instance, and the war in Bosnia in, in the 1990s, this is what really produced the biggest tragedy, the so-called leopard skin structure uh, I don't know if it's a good English translation, but uh, the leopard skin means that, you know, there are no, it's not zebra. Yeah. You can't yeah. divide the, 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 the black stripes from the white stripes. I see the It's image. all the, you know, whatever, ethnically, ethnically speaking. Uh, so you're talking about people who belong to different ethnicities, but yet live next to each other and do know each other. So it's not a hatred of, an, well, you know, I'm, I don't know, um, American person having a problem with Iranian person or something mm -hmm. like that. So hatred of differences, where the dividing, well, the motivation is in non-understanding, actually. Here it's a, it's a, it's a hatred of so-called small differences, mm -hmm. but I really do think that it's not even that. I really do think that the hatred springs from the fact that we do recognize each other in the other, in the other person. And I think this is what produces frustration and, uh, and nervousness. It all happens, I only have to say, in the, in the part of uh, Europe uh, where you know, everything crumbles to tiny little pieces. So the space is pretty limited. You're saying you bring in a new element, very interesting. You're saying there's an element of self-hatred. Yeah. If your opponent looks like you, talks like you, behaves like you, eats like you, uh, likes the same music as you, um, there is a source of irritation. Yeah, yeah. There was a... Um, I was going to say famous article. It wasn't really a famous article. It was just an article that meant a lot to me, uh, written by Boris Budden in the end of the 1990s. And it was called, If I Could Be a U Ustasha and a Yugoslav. Mm. Ustasha are the right-wing uh, Croatian... Uh, 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 military force uh, throughout the uh, Second World War, and the right-wing Croatians are called called the Ustashas. And it, it discussed uh, the right-wing Croatian person who was actually an active, uh, active member of the, of the war, uh, who was sued by the court because he was playing uh, uh, Serbian turbo folk music in his mm -hmm. kafana. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now... Um, I don't know whether people in, 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 in Bratislava could really understand all these, um, um, all these things. But that was such a funny, funny article mm. for me. Because he said, who, who can really stop me from playing, playing Turbo Folk in my, in my pub? I mean, I have a son. I named him Ante Pavelic. 
and now Ante Pavelic was the 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 the, the uh, uh, ruler of the fascist Croatia in the in the Second World War. So he was saying, "I'm twice a Croatian, and this is exactly the reason why I can play Serbian music." <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't say much about hatred, but it actually says a lot about confusion and about sense of humor, which oh yeah in all of these countries might be uh, the, the, the saving force as well yeah. sometimes. Jens Martin Eriksen. Now, we've heard a few examples. Um, all of you gave some examples of, of recent um, uh, uh, violence and hatred and intolerance. Um, you are very good at saying, listen, if we keep fighting each other about symbols, about... Um, the music that we play, uh, uh, the, the, the flags that we wave, if we keep fighting about symbols, we neglect the underlying discourse. And that might be a solution, the way out. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I could uh, maybe uh, introduce you to um, uh, a sort of enigma. Uh, it's also a symbol. It's the I show you, I don't know if you can see that, but I can, at least I can explain what's on the picture if you can't see it. This is the, a cover of a, a French version of our book. Uh, it's called Le Piège de la Culture. It translates uh, the traps of culture. What does that mean? Uh, here is two people kissing each other. It's a kind of uh, aesthetic from Benetton or something like that, uh, manipulated. It's uh, supposed to be a, a Muslim girl with a veil and uh, a Jewish boy, uh, Orthodox Jewish boy, kissing each other. That's supposed to be provocative for somebody. I would say if somebody has a problem with that photo, it's their problem, it's not the photo. Uh, nevertheless, why? I ask a Muslim friend, an Egyptian writer, what would be the problem with this? Uh, he explained to me, I knew it, but he explained, uh, it's because you are not allowed to outmarry as a Muslim girl. You're not allowed to outmarry, uh, f uh, marry a non-Muslim man. This is one of the tenets in in Islam, and that's more a sort of. It's not only it's not only uh, ex extremists who believe in that. This is a sort of commonplace thing. And um, I would also mention uh, another example from a sort of Christian uh, context. But now a little bit more about this. This is when culture becomes an ideology. We call it culturalism, like in multiculturalism. And that's what we were writing about against this uh, culturalism. Uh, we're not against multi, we're against culturalism. When culture becomes a prison, when culture becomes an ideology, and uh, uh, culture will discipline the individuals to follow, and you have to meet all the cultural markers of a specific culture to be the right, uh, to be of the right faith. That's when the trap of culture is working. And uh, I'll give you another example. This was something that you would really have to confront when you discuss with a person who m will maintain that uh, a girl is not allowed to marry a non-Muslim man and so on. This is antagonistic to human rights and there's no compromise. Uh, some tenets in our cultures will have to change in order to meet the demands of human rights. It's, it's, you can go on discussing for ages, but you have to change it. Uh, I, uh, I was working on a book about right-wing nationalism in Serbia uh, in a book called the, the World of the Scorpions, and I talked to a, a, a group of anti-gay activists, uh, the leader, actually, of a group called Obras, uh, and I, I was trying, I had the same curiosity, where does it come from? How are you motivated? Why are you so anti-gay? Why don't you just, in a libertarian way, leave everybody alone, as somebody coined it uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that, that's sort of the, the shortest way you can say it, a libertarian, leave everybody alone. Uh, let people live their lives. But it's not so easy, because if you have adopted this ideology, you, you, you demand, you, have a, you, have a, you demand of all the individuals, you try to discipline them. Uh, and I was talking to this bloke, and I said, 
why are you so much against these uh, gay people? It was in 2010. There was actually a gay pride in, in, in 2010. It was also attacked. It was a horrible day. Uh, and, uh, and then he said, but yes, but I also want the, the gay people to leave us alone. And I don't know. I mean, they haven't attacked anybody. But just the very presence of being gay mm -hmm. and Serb disturbed him. So I said, what if they were Germans? What if they were Danish guys? What if they were Dutch? Mm -hmm. uh, would you care? And he said, no, I don't care. I, I'm not interested then. Okay. So we get closer to the answer. Mm -hmm. If you imagine the culture, your own identity, your part of it is, if you imagine this as a kind of congregation, as a, as a very tightly knit network, where you have to meet all the markers. You have to be heterosexual, you have to be mm -hmm. orthodox. I mean, to be Protestant is even a, a terrible thing in Serbia. But to be, to be, you have to meet all the markers uh, to be the right kind of person. And that goes in that context. That goes also in the Muslim context. This is basically, uh, and also from our books when we studied the, the things in, in, in Bosnia, this is basically, <coughs> the root of all of the evil in this particular meaning of the word hate. Hate is a big concept. Hate can also be personal. Now we are dealing with it in a specific way, clash of cultures. Uh, how can we manage? How can we... Uh, I think the basic thing is that we must confront this and we must also consider a community more and more complex with more and more diversity. Uh, I mean which is an evidently uh, invisible part of the globalization, mm -hmm. that we are different people, mm -hmm. and some come to Europe and to our country with another faith. We cannot, it's, I mean, really a nonsense to talk about people should change their identity, but they will all have to change. We will all have to meet. We will all have to find a compromise, meeting the human right, the basic mm -hmm. human right. Mm -hmm. So culture, when you hear that, Culture is never an argument. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. try to put it off as an argument. Also during the Muhammad it's crisis. It's been made into an argument. It's been mm -hmm. made into an yeah. argument. It's a manipulation. And what you're basically saying, if, if we keep walking into that uh, culture trap, if we keep defining ourselves by saying we have to meet all the markers, otherwise we're not true Serb, Dane, Dutch, whatever, uh, we will never get out of this uh, uh, vicious cycle. Now, I mean, basically, um, I think I think this is this is true for all societies. I think this is true for for this could be the next step forward. Um, Andrzej Stasiuk, I would like to ask you if you listen to this story. Do you share um, Martin Simechka's fear that he pronounced in the introduction to, to this, this forum here, that if we cannot break the vicious cycle of um, hate speech, of the cultural trap, that we might be on our way to losing democracy, period. The democracy that so many people have fought for, especially in this part of Europe. No to jest dramatyczne pytanie. Ale wiecie, ja byłem tego roku... Byłem w Chinach. I to jest społeczeństwo, Aha. które ma... No, półtora miliarda niedługo będzie miało, ma w tej chwili. I trudno nazwać tamten ustrój, tamto społeczeństwo demokratycznym. a jednocześnie wydaje się, że jest dynamiczne, szczęśliwe, takim trudnym szczęściem, ale energia, która bije z pekińskiej ulicy na przykład, czy z mniejszych miast gdzieś, w których byłem, jest niewyobrażalna w europejskich czy amerykańskich warunkach. Więc ja nie wiem, co jest z tą demokracją, naprawdę. No. 
Ja wiem, że to zabrzmi potwornie, ale może to jest kolejny fetysz rzeczywiście. Może świat się nie skończy na demokracji. Mhm. Ja bardzo przepraszam, ale <śmiech> tego uczą też podróże po świecie, po takich dziwnych miejscach. Mhm. Że no, uczą nas pytań po prostu o nasze miejsce gdzieś. No uczą pytań, nie uczą odpowiedzi rzeczywiście. Także nie wiem, jak z tą demokracją jest. Nie wiem. It's... Okay, so you just more or less exploded this whole panel. Uh, Because you're actually saying, well, democracy is good as long as it lasts, but maybe we can do without, maybe we can uh, transform ourselves a little bit more into the Chinese kind of energy, and that's fine as well. Nie, musimy wymyśleć coś lepszego od Chińczyków. Z czym... Na przykład coś takiego, czym oni by się A. zainteresowali. Oni się nie interesują naszą demokracją. Oni się interesują naszą technologią. No, poza elitą, poza studentami, poza... Ale to jest na no, wierzchołek społeczeństwa tak. gdzieś. Dlatego być może no, przyszłością jest ustrój, który zaimponuje mm -hmm. Chińczykom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Może jeszcze stać zachód na taki wysiłek. Nie wiem. Ja. Yeah. Ja. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I przepraszam. You make it sound ironical, but there might be a, a really deep truth behind this. Um, Vladimir Asenievich. Could be that in this part of Europe where uh, democracy has been reinvented over the past two decades, that this might be the right part to actually go beyond democracy towards an other kind of society, to let go of what we all um, admire so much, a system that has worked until now, Maybe there's something new on the horizon. Could you imagine, following Stasiuk's words, could you imagine, let's say, a post-democratic Serbia that would actually function and make the Chinese jealous as well? <laughs> <laughs> We hardly ever manage to make anybody jealous about anything. It's about time. Maybe some food, mm -hmm. some music, mm -hmm. uh, things, you know, the peripheral things, so to say. But uh, the real stuff, we kind of, you know, we are good at failing. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you're not one of those people who, uh, how do you say, who uh, uh, surrenders to that self-image. Me, myself? Mm. No, but I have to say that uh, um, so many people are disenchanted with democracy that you can't just boil it down to right-wing sentiment or mm -hmm. to ultra, mm -hmm. ultra mm -hmm. non-democratic right-wing mm -hmm. uh, sentiment. Uh, we have seen the democracy being taken away by, uh, you know, ruthless people, misused in a, in a big way. We have seen also... Uh, a democratic st uh, system making people uh, stuck within their own, um, uh, again, national and ethnic identities, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. in Bosnia, mm -hmm. where it is virtually impossible to vote for anybody but for your own national mm -hmm. party. Mm -hmm. And then you have a... So what effectively democracy does, for instance, in Bosnia, is uh, really deepening the, the ethnic uh, misunderstandings mm -hmm. and uh, differences and strengthening the particular yeah. identities and really ruining the unifying, uh, for instance, Bosnian, mm -hmm. Bosnian identity. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, as, uh, as uh, Jens Martin has said, uh, do we really need to really uh, kind of tick in all the right markers to be well accepted? So what, well, just... Theoretically speaking, what if, you know, in this one society, the democratic system does not work? Mm -hmm. It produces the counter. Mm -hmm. 
result. Do how, see, do we, do how do we really deal with that? I, on a, on a, I'm sorry, on a European level, now again, the question of discourse, can we really talk about it? Do we have the right words to really discuss it properly? Now, to me, this is an issue because we have seen democracy twisting and turning into things absolutely unimaginable. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. several decades ago, mm -hmm. we could not mm -hmm. even think about yeah. things that we have as examples right now. Okay, we're really going into the deep end now. Um, yes, uh, European Union model of the European democracy with welfare state and, and whatever um, is turned into um, a mockery in some of the member states. We know in Serbia it's being regarded with great ambivalence. In Serbia right now, people are probably not sure if they actually want to enter or not, because it might bring you more trouble than before. Um, and what we're discussing now, thanks to Staziuk, is there might be something beyond this dogma of parliamentary democracy as we have been evaluating it for so, such a long time. Well, you know, uh, we had uh, the then President Milosevic, mm -hmm. who actually, you know, out of historical paradox, led us into democracy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the first mm -hmm. first democratic elections were mm -hmm. actually happening mm -hmm. during during his age mm -hmm. and uh, his rule. Uh, he was very, I mean, the, the whole the whole clique behind him was resisting it as much as they could. So, out of all the Yugoslav um, uh, constituent uh, republics, Serbia was the last one to have uh, democratic, democratic elections. They did happen in Croatia already, in Bosnia and everywhere else, so when there was no way to resist it, uh, there was Serbia. But in this meantime, so between the one-party system and the actual multi-party system, there was a number of ideas. Uh, uh, trying to explain that Serbia does not really need parliamentary democracy as such. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was an offer of the non-party non democratic mm -hmm. system and all that, all that kind of stuff. So I'm very, very weary, I have to say, and uh, sort of uh, uh, I don't really believe much in, um, you know, different experiments that, you know, I'm supposed to uh, kind of check out on my own skin. Uh, so, I, uh, in that sense, I probably am conservative because I do believe in, uh, in lesser evil somehow, particularly in the countries uh, like the one in which I live. Because I think really there is one thing that uh, every single politics need to follow, and this is the well-being of the people. Mm -hmm. And I really do think that everything else needs to be secondary, secondary to that. Mm -hmm. So all huge social experiments cost a lot in terms of, you yeah. know, the, the mm -hmm. stability and the well-being okay. of the people and okay. everything, and okay. I do resent that. Good. Uh, I think you just helped us defuse the bomb that Andrzej Stasiu just put beneath oh. this debate. No, but I like the bomb, actually, yes, as well. And I have to we say, like the bomb, but we're well, not no. maybe right ready to have it explode immediately. No, but uh, for instance, I was really, I don't know whether now we're putting together, you know, things that could not really mm. be put together. But I have to mention this because I never, ne for instance, I never talked about now what I'm going to say in, in this way that I'm going to do now. But today the news were full of uh, the news of uh, the court in Hague. Uh, um, now, what's the right word? The Hague Tribunal. The Hague the, Tribunal the, the, the decided Yugoslav to free... Tribunal. Uh, uh, General, former General Gotovina and former General Mercep, who were uh, 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 leading the uh, uh, Croatian uh, Oluja uh, um, well, uh, military campaign, which ended the war in Croatia and liberated the parts of uh, Croatia which were populated by the Serbs. Uh, and, you know, this, this was the thing in which thousands of people died in a really horrific way, and 200,000 people were displaced. And if you just see the images, you know, it's clear that these are kids, old ladies, uh, peasants, just pure mm -hmm. civilians. Mm -hmm. And yet these two people are pronounced non-guilty by, by the Hague Tribunal. Very surprising. Yeah? Now again, we mm -hmm. do not have words to discuss it. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something that I find extremely worrying. Mm -hmm. if, if I'm to say 
that the Hague Tribunal is really uh, um, denying its own, you know, sense of being or just just the the, the purest thing that it is in, inside it. Mm -hmm. So I wonder why it, why it is done. Yeah. And then if we talk about hatred, so now what would people think? Would, would the Serb Serbian people be happy about it? Mm. Would it be really, really happy with Europe now? W would they really want to, to join in and, you know, have these things? So, you know, the, the whole thing is enormously complex. And in that sense, I don't think that uh, Andrzej was really placing the bomb. I think that he was really stating the obvious. And I also very well understand your statement that you say, okay, but maybe I'm not ready to uh, experiment with my own skin yeah. right now just yet. Um, Jens Martin Eriksson, finally. All these examples, all these attempts at looking beyond uh, the democracy that we've reached until now, um, tell us that in order to... Okay, let me summarize. Uh, in order to... to, to think beyond uh, the democracy as we've known it right now, as it's been uh, uh, represented by our nation states, by our parliamentary democracies, by the European Union system. This has produced a number of institutions and examples that uh, um, produce the contrary effect. Bosnia is trapped in democracy. Even in a very different way, you might say Hungary is trapped in democracy right now. Um, the Hague Tribunal, symbol of justice, in a very balanced way, is now producing a verdict that will surely backfire among the Serbian population. Uh, what do you think, as, a, as an expert also on this region, what do you think? Um, could we learn from the let's say, the, the, the caricature of democracy that is sometimes reproduced in the countries we've just mentioned. Could we learn from that character, a caricature how to proceed, how to go forward to a, to a new model, a model in which you don't have to meet all the markers to uh, establish your own identity in order to, to, you know, to permanently get stuck in multicultural trouble? I think it's fair to say that the, um, what, what happened in, um, in Bosnia is a good example of, of what is only formally a democracy. Uh, because what happens if every, the three groups in, uh, in Bosnia, if they, as happened, they, or they were organized in three different parties along religious and ethnic lines, or more, uh, along religious lines, um, the uh, Democratic Action Party for the Muslims, and then you have the SDS and the uh, and the, the Croats Party. Uh, what happened? Somebody has has coined it in this way: you take politics out of politics. That's what happens when politics become ethnic. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And when you take politics out of politics, it's not. It's no more an election. It's only a counting of people. And what happens is that the public sphere, which there is no democracy if you don't can't hold uh, uh, politicians accountable, so so it's only a formal thing. Um, so uh, what happens is that it's perverted and uh, and it doesn't it's it's not really it's it's more propaganda than anything else. Uh, I have witnessed the same. Uh, well, I couldn't say the same system because it was actually there was no there was no war in Malaysia. But I went to Malaysia when we were working with this book. This is the mm -hmm. uh, English one, the Democratic Contradictions of Multiculturalism. There is a section in it where we analyze real multiculturalism, where culture is an ideology. It's precisely the same, basically, as the system, mm -hmm. the, the Bosnian ethnic system. You have three groups. It's working. It's a rich country. They have oil and so on. So it's, it's working, at least. But it's a very extremely conservative and authoritarian society. Uh, and uh, the three groups don't intermarry. The three groups, they don't mix. They just live in segregation. And this is the future of, of a society where 
culture becomes ideology, uh, we will develop a segregation, and that's what's going on in the Western part of Europe at least. We are segregating more and more and more. Uh, 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 Muslim kids go to Muslim schools. When they reach more than 30% in a public school, the, the, uh, the uh, ethnic, I mean, if it's in Denmark, the ethnic Danish people take their kids out. Mm -hmm. That's just what's mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. So it's getting more and more segregated. They don't intermarry, they don't uh, mix and so on. Uh, and it's due to the fact that the religion and, and uh, has certain tenets that, that mm -hmm. prevent people from mixing and they don't break out. So this is the, this is the, the trap of culture. Okay, you don't sound like you like this situation, but are you saying that this will be our future? No, that I we think... we will go inevitably towards the Malaysian model? No, I don't think so. I think the, uh, there's a kind of backlash against uh, culturalism. <coughs> and, uh, of course, I, I support free speech. I support, uh, I'm against hate, law, hate speech laws and so on. I think it's better to confront everybody. Mm. Uh, with what they say and what they write. Uh, I don't want to pervert uh, uh, things so they pop up in a different and weird, weird uh, way. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the answer to all this is liberal democracy version 1.0. 3.0, I would say. Thank you. Now, um, final round. Before we, we get the final statements from the speakers, I would... Love you to um, add your own questions. In order to do so, would it be possible to raise the audience light a little bit? So, because we can hardly see your faces. No, if it's possible. Oh, you just have to do it like this. Yes. In any case, um, if somebody would like a question, please uh, raise your hand, stand up, tell us your name, give us the question, and direct it towards one of these people. I know we've covered some tough ground, so I'm sure you have some question marks. Right, now we okay. can see you. Who's brave enough to go first? Meerlicht. Who's still awake to go first? Here's right. Awake. Could you stand up, ma'am? And speak up a bit so everyone can hear you. It's fine. Could you? Can you give her a mic? Yeah. Microphone is coming your way. Oh, no, it's okay. Phone is on the way. Is it on? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, I'll say it again. I'm from Bratislava. Uh, my name is Daniela Rozgonova. I found your discussion absolutely fascinating and very good, and I've read all the materials that mm -hmm. were available mm -hmm. ahead of time. Very good. I think that uh, seen from here and on this date, you know, on the eve on the anniver of the anniversary, it seems that it all needs time. It's just a question mm -hmm. of time. Meanwhile, of course, we need time, I mean, to develop more democratic ways of doing politics, of behaving, developing a civil society, because that's the secret, probably, and a public that is educated enough to watch over the politicians so that they don't transgress, etc., etc. But it obviously takes time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The problem is that meanwhile, while we are on this learning curve, it's very dangerous. And we have to live with that, mm -hmm. obviously. You know. Thank you. Uh, Vladimir, that is probably a very, very true thing to say. But do we have the time? Because the urgency is so high, uh, the stakes are so high, the examples of the explosive atmosphere are so many. Can we, can we survive just thinking, okay, as long as we take our time, we'll be fine? Yeah. 
I think we always look for answers in the field of the politics, whereas I really do believe, uh, unfortunately, that most of the answers are hidden in the field of the economy. Mm -hmm. And this, this is, I think, behind the Chinese uh, mm -hmm. uh, thing in the, in the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, once you have a stable and successful economy, all these other things are fairly possible, basically. And uh, no democracy has ever really stopped people from hating each other, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, particularly in the, in the places like, like, again, like the Balkans uh, and stuff. So I, I do think, I remember, um, now th this, is, this is a reductionism or something, but uh, the, what's his name, um, Goran Bregovic, the, the, the famous rock star from the 1970s, well, even now, obviously. So um, um, in the time preceding the war in Yugoslavia, uh, you know, we have been living in this, you know, really weird vacuum and then it all exploded very violently. And then he said, if you just swap dollar for dinner, you will have a civil war between, you know, yeah, uh, white Americans and Afro-Americans and mm -hmm. Native Americans and whatever Americans, Central Americans. And you will have a peaceful and stable Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. And re reductive as it is, I think he really did make a point, and, and, and it does stand still. Uh, I, work on, I want to make it really simple, because I think this is, this is how the, the huge majority of the people think. Uh, uh, if I can occupy my mind, uh, kind of planning my next exotic summer holiday, I'm not really going to have enough time to hate my neighbor. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, again, we can, we can feel sorry that it works in so, on such level, but I do think, based on my experience in a pretty tough reality, that this is how it worked. It's not the political, it's not the political field that produced uh, the breakup of Yugoslavia. It was really a lousy economy, okay. hugely lousy okay. economy. And this is, it took us a long, long time to really get to understand that. Mm -hmm. and, right, yeah. so we need time, we need money. We need money, yeah. <laughs> I still have the feeling we'll. We're we need not something there else yet. as well. Yes, I mean, yes, you know, yes. but, you know, if we need to make it really, really clear, I'd rather opt for, like, uh, you know, lots of money, but not in terms of bad credits, which is something that we usually get and end up in a really even more debt than before. So, yeah, we need uh, the, money. The, the, the painful truth is that you can turn this around as well. I mean, uh, um, let's say. To put it very bluntly, if you hadn't gone into war, your economy might be better now, too. Well, yeah. Well, we can go on forever yes. like this. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not. If our economy was better, we would, yeah. yeah. Um, other questions? And I would actually prefer questions directed to one of the three gentlemen here. Uh, In the back there, sir. Sorry. Mm. I'm Sauka Chaudhary from Slovakia. Uh, obviously, I'm an immigrant here, uh, but uh, Slovak national now. Uh, my question is for my uh, Danish friend. Mm -hmm. As he told, there is a cultural trap. I agree with it, if you consider the immigrant community. And in the same sense, I have a feeling, as you told, that when non-immigrant population are taking away their kids from the schools, probably some other identity trap also there. Mm -hmm. It's the first thing, whether in such situation, I'm not going to discuss or dissection the identity trap of uh, different uh, religious or uh, ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic groups living uh, besides, like in Malaysia which one I consider also that it is too much uh, blocked. Uh, in such situation, my question for you, uh, the background, what makes the local uh, ethnicity to take care of their kids, whether we're discussing that matter also, which we can go to the past of Europe in sense of the enlightenment or in sense of all our experience of from Holocaust to all those uh, of, uh, world wars in Europe. Uh, it is the first part, whether we have to discuss that thing also, that trap also. And the second question is, uh, whether 
in the mainstream of discussion about multiculturality, I am not using intentionally the word multiculturalism, uh, whether in the mainstream there is a discussion about the globalization, uh, its effect on the locals who are not globalized. I'm living in a small town in Slovakia. <laughs> I will not find out even three persons who are in... in in uh, 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 frequently uh, in last 10 years outside Europe. Okay. So uh, whether the globalization, its effect on the immigrant community, on, on the non-immigrant community, and its dynamics itself also are addressed in the, in the, in the mainstream discussion. Because Thank you so much. Yeah, it is my second question. Thank you. Good. Okay. Both I of them. Will, I will, I will yes. try to answer with a joint answer. Great. Uh, no, it's it's true that um, that they, um, I will I will give you a little story I'll, uh, from also this time from Norway a very little story about what happened this summer because some an art director from the art museum of Trondheim in the middle of Norway he made a very strange statement very interesting statement his name is Pontus Kianda. Um, he said, I will no longer use the Norwegian flag at my museum because I consider the Norwegian flag to be exclusive. It's not able to gather uh, all the immigrant and non-Christian and people who have come to this country with another faith. It's exclusive, so I won't use it. Of course... Some people said this is pure nonsense, but let's try to follow him. Let's 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 just as a hypothesis, uh, hypothetically say, okay, what if he was right? What if he was right? What because what he's doing, he's opening a discussion of what what kind of symbol we have for a community and what kind of community do we have if we no longer share religion, language, culture, dogmas. All what we what is our universe? What 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 would be the community? Uh, this is the extreme. But what he's trying to do, you can say it's nonsense what he's saying. But you can also try to follow him, just to to develop it, and say what he's trying to do is he's trying to deconstruct. He's trying to criticize maybe an idea of the ethnic state. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been so many you know, uh, uh, initiatives in Europe, uh, like uh, Sarkozy, who put a ban on burqa, who put a ban on veil, and there's been this uh, ref referendum in Switzerland where they put a ban on, on minarets, construction of minarets. And, uh, of course, it's not only a right-wing, it's called UDC, this is a right-wing, whatever, populist party who proposed it, but there's not, it's only 10% of the Swiss people who support that. But there were more than 50% 50, 50 who supported this ban. And of course, there are also liberal minded people who do it. Why do they do it? As a protest, they asked them after, why did you do that? Because we support a liberal ban on this because we want to protest. Because there are some illiberal tenets that are never discussed mm -hmm. in Islam. So we want to, as a protest, to provoke this situation. And it gives a very fairly good Im impression of how the public sphere is corrupted. So there's obviously something that some people want to discuss, but they can't discuss it. So to, to, to uh, end this answer is that Kianda is trying to, to attack these counterattacks, you know, like, uh, like uh, the Sarkozy's uh, uh, law and this uh, Minaret law. And he's putting into question what kind of community are we living in? What kind of, is it an ethnic state or is it a state that is able to comprise all nationalities? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, still, I think the essential thing is always, how can I, how can I, from my background, compromise? I mean, how, what kind of compromises do I need to mm -hmm. meet in order to meet the, the basic human rights? Mm -hmm. This is always the, this is the answer, I think. These are some fascinating examples, beginning with the, the museum director in Trondheim, Norway, of people trying to uh, um, get beyond the symbols, get rid of the symbols, in order to get beyond the cultural trap. As, a, as an an answer to your two very, very essential questions, sir. 
So we're still in the phase of asking the right questions. We're not yet finding the final answers to the difficult topics of this afternoon. We have about uh, five minutes left to reach the answers. Who, okay. who would like to ask a final question to the panel here? Ah, two final questions. That's great. You, sir. Hello. 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 Uh, my name is Lubos Groch. Uh, I'd like to ask you this question. Uh, we share the same anatomy, the same physiology. What else do we share? What else do we as human mankind have in common? Uh, if we can establish some common ground so that we don't hate or kill each other. Would you like one of these gentlemen in specific to answer that? Anyone. May I uh, ask a question to Andrzej Staziuk? A great observer of the differences among human beings. <laughs> Could you answer this gentleman <laughs> by telling us what we do have in common, actually? Dlaczego ja dostałem najtrudniejsze pytanie? <laughs> nie wiem. Naprawdę nie wiem. Nie potrafię odpowiedzieć na to pytanie. Myślę, że każdy w, w cichości swojego serca powinien na to odpowiedzieć. Nie, no, mógłbym powiedzieć, wiara, nadzieja, miłość, ale... <laughs> ale nie, nie powiem tego. One, one more question. Why actually will you not say belief, belief hope and love? Może to kogoś dotknąć. Nie, po prostu współczesność nie daje odpowiedzi na to pytanie. I to jest ten tragiczny wybór, przed którym stoimy. Sami sobie dajemy odpowiedź. I sami bierzemy odpowiedzialność za to. I nikt nam już w tym nie pomoże. Nikt. Skoń skończyło się. Spoken truly. And I believe you will agree. Final question. Speak out loudly, ma'am. Príjemný dobrý večer, Prajem. Volám sa Alžbeta Liptáková, som z Komárna. Že čo máme spoločné? Len dve slova poviem. Máme rovnaké slzy a rovnakú krv. Ďakujem pekne. Hmm. Hmm. True. Thank you very much. Our sorrow sometimes can also be a binding element. Uh, there was one gentleman who wanted to ask something, yes, and that will be the final question, I believe, from the audience. Hi, uh, my name is Alexandre. Um, Could you stand up so everyone yeah, can admire you? Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, I want, my question was about what can we do as a democracy? because we are still a democracy. Uh, I was thinking about um, uh, where, why there is hatred between two people or two groups of people. And, and I observed that they have a tendency of not speaking to each other. Like they start to, to isolate themselves. So when you're isolated from another group or another person, you hate you, the hatred. <laughs> That's not me. <laughs> The hatred is going to grow, so um, we have to uh, establish a dialogue to create a, a dialogue, communication. So how, how can democracy 
or how can a society create dialogues between between people like what do what means do we have like can we use uh, i'm asking anyone your question is what means can we use to create an effective effective dialogue well vladimir asinevich i'm for sure that you're breaking your mind every day about that question yeah um, um, I am breaking my mind. I'm also trying to do something as well. Uh, Good. It, it makes more sense. Good. And again, based on just my experiences from where I come from, there was a, a dramatic point in the year 2000 uh, when uh, all, the, all the matters which kept the situation of war alive have stopped existing, uh, quite literally, in the sense that uh, already mentioned President Milosevic in Serbia was uh, lost the elections was arrested, was taken to, 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 to The Hague, eventually died in, uh, in his prison cell. And also President Tuđman from Croatia died in, in the year 2000. And Serbia was bombed to pieces throughout 99 and 2000, so all the infrastructure which was running the war was, was not there anymore. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 that was like a zero point for, for, the, for what we live now, which is the future. Uh, which is definitely much bleaker than we thought it was going to be. Uh, but still, that was the point when we could re, um, re-communicate. I don't know whether that word it probably does not exist, but I hope, hope it's, uh, it's clear enough. And um, you could, you know, you had two choices. Uh, you could wait for the institutions to make up their minds and start doing things on a high political level, or you could go from the bottom and do your own thing, uh, and basically do it in a very modest way. And I do believe in small numbers. I do believe in the strength of the small numbers. And the, the, well, this is why this image is so so important, mm -hmm. because it just show you shows you one one girl and one boy kissing each other, and already there the revolution happens. Mm -hmm. So you even maybe I mean you would need more, obviously. But this is how you start. And, and this is how the large numbers happen. Mm -hmm. So once if you have a uh, hundred Muslim girls kissing a hundred Orthodox Jewish boys, well, good enough. We're going for a thousand. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, uh, the writers, and this is something in which I'm extremely proud, uh, in the region of former Yugoslavia, have started to get together much earlier than any other segment of the society. And already in the year 2000, there was a several, several um, uh, regional literary festivals. The publishers have started to publish books, uh, uh, you know, Croatian books in Serbia, Serbian books in Bosnia, and vice versa, and vice versa. So in that sense, my, my idea is that you never, ever wait for the politicians to do something. Mm -hmm. You just do it in a sense and as much as you can uh, uh, in your own life. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's how it's being done. Great. I want to thank you for that. Um, I want to thank all three of you for this fiercely concentrated, complicated hour of trying to answer the questions that this forum has posed to us. Um, we started out by saying that, yes, hatred is all over our societies, and probably many people regard it as a, as a fixed, permanent part of their identity. Uh, sometimes this goes to radical extremes like we've seen, unfortunately, in, in, in Norway with Breivik's Iranian version of Christianity. Uh, sometimes it's more down to earth. It's about the self-hatred of looking at somebody who looks exactly like you and the, the violence, the, the animosity of the small differences. Um, all of this means that we might be stuck in the cultural trap that you talked about where we have to meet all the markers and these lines are being, these trenches are being dug in deeper every day. Uh, but this will not produce a model that the Chinese will envy. If we want them to be jealous of us, we have to go one step further. Um, obviously, not all of us are ready to experiment on our own skins, but it's clear that we have to, to, to come up with something new. What new? Jens Martin Eriksson uh, is very eloquent in saying at least we have to uh, get rid of some of these symbols or at least not get stuck in discussing them, fighting about them. 
get beyond the, the culture trap. For that, we might need a few things for sure, all of us. Time, as you said, money, of course. Mm, but finally, the responsibility, as Andrei Stasiuk says, uh, lies within our own hearts. It starts with me and you personally. Uh, it starts with the small numbers, but finally this afternoon has produced a vision that I can leave Bratislava with, with a happy heart. A thousand Muslim girls kissing a thousand Jewish boys. <laughs> That's what we're going for. Andrei Stasiuk, Vladimir Asenievich and Jens Martin Eriksson, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.